TTSNet and ASAIO have collaborated to bring to you this live webinar. Today's topic is ECMO for COVID ARDS. If you have questions or comments you would like to submit to the panelists, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom window. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and the archive version will be available soon on the CTSNet website and YouTube channel. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Slaughter to introduce today's moderators. Thank you, uh, uh, Jasmine. I just wanted to take a minute and uh, first thank all of our moderators and panelists uh, for taking time out of their uh, busy days. Uh, it's a very important and timely topic. Uh, the pandemic has not gone away uh, and we still need to uh, see what's the best therapies, what we've learned and what we can do going forward. Uh, similarly, as uh, we're very proud that ASIO Journal is the uh, leading journal for artificial organ development, uh, of which ECMO is one of our areas of uh, interest and uh, expertise. As part of the journal, we've started now a quarterly webinar uh, series. Uh, this is our first uh, that we're very uh, happy and excited uh, uh, to hold. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce our new uh, section editors uh, for the ASIO Journal webinar series. Uh, that will be Dr. Adam Fotos. He's the Chief of Adult Cardiac Surgery at the University of Mississippi. And Dr. Jaya Kumar, Assistant Professor of uh, Cardiothoracic Surgery uh, at the University of Mississippi. Uh, Adam? Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Slaughter. Um, just to echo Dr. Slaughter's sentiments, we couldn't be more excited about having the panelists today and really thank everybody for taking the time to join us. Um, hopefully, as we um, kind of all come together and find out new paradigms and management strategies for um, ECMO in the new COVID era. So with that, um, I'll start uh, introducing our panelists today. The first one we'll be talking with is Dr. Daniel Brody. Dr. Brody is the Section Chief for Critical Care um, at Milstein and Allen Hospitals and Director of the Medical ICUs at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons at New York Presbyterian. He is also the Director of the Adult ECMO Program and Director of the Center for Acute Respiratory Failure. He is the chairman of the executive committee for the International ECMO Network, um, an organization dedicated to providing high quality research in the field of ECMO. He is primary or co-primary investigator for multiple ongoing and upcoming studies in ECMO. And Dr. Brody is also the president elect of the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization. Welcome Dr. Brody. Next, we'll be talking with Dr. Matthew Paquetta. He is the associate chair and professor of thoracic surgery at Vanderbilt University. He is the director of the ECMO program there, as well as the surgical director of the Vanderbilt Respiratory Institute. He has also authored or co-authored many publications on the subject of ECMO and has been instrumental in developing the role of transplantation in COVID ARDS patients. Welcome, Dr. Paquetta. And last, we have Dr. Haft, who is currently a professor of thoracic surgery and surgical critical care at the University of Michigan. He is authored many articles on ECMO, VADS, and transplantation, as well as pulmonary failure. He is the past president of ASAIO and currently on its board of trustees. He serves as the chair of the STS workforce on end-stage cardiopulmonary disease, as well as the chairman for the technology committee at ELSO, in addition to serving as medical director of the ECMO program at the University of Michigan. Welcome, Dr. Haft. Okay, so we're excited to have all of our panelists today, and with that, I think we'll just dive right in with an initial poll of our audience um, before we start talking with Dr. Brody, um, because we just would like to see what the general experience is of the attendees. So that first poll is up and we'll give everybody a minute to respond. We're, we're interested in how many ECMO patients, uh, VV ECMO patients for COVID ARDS you guys have done at your relative institutions, wherever they may be. And this can kind of provide a launching point for us to begin our discussions on the data um, surrounding uh, ECMO in COVID ARDS patients, which is what Dr. Brody will be talking with us about. Okay, I'm gonna give everybody a couple more seconds. And we'll end it there.
All right, everybody should see the poll. Dr. Brody, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now if you wanna load up your slide presentation. All right, Adam, thank you very much. Um, so uh, first of all, I really want, appreciate uh, the invitation to speak on this uh, terrific panel uh, with my colleagues, uh, Drs. Paquetta and Haft, uh, who are uh, obviously uh, uh, tremendous names in the field. Uh, and uh, this is really a great webinar series being put together by Asayo Journal and CTSnet. So I'm very excited to be part of this. Um, what I was asked to talk about today is ECMO and COVID-19 related ARDS to focus on the evidence uh, for, uh, for doing that at this time, which of course is an hour long talk that I'm gonna give you in 10 minutes. Uh, these are uh, my current disclosures. And what I'm gonna do is talk about the role, uh, first of all, of ECMO uh, for COVID-19 uh, related ARDS in general. And I'd start with this paper that uh, we published with Eddie Fan in the lead uh, uh, in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, really suggesting that uh, this is a call for adherence to, to the current evidence-based algorithm for ARDS. There was a lot of talk early in the pandemic about approaching ARDS differently, uh, and both in terms of ECMO and in terms of other therapies for uh, ARDS, until there's evidence to the contrary, we should follow the, the current management algorithm. And this is that algorithm where uh, you follow, uh, uh, treat the underlying uh, illness, uh, if it's pneumonia, treat with antibiotics, for instance, uh, it won't do much good to put somebody on ECMO if you're not doing that. Um, standard lung protective ventilation, and if the PDEF ratio is still less than 150, prone positioning is uh, highly recommended. There are other potential therapies, but ultimately, as you can see in the circle, if you meet criteria based on EOLIA for, uh, for ECMO after having done all of that, uh, and there are no contraindications, then that's when ECMO would be indicated. And the idea is that it's the same whether it's uh, COVID or not. Uh, to what about specific to COVID-19? Well, there, there's clearly now accumulating evidence, including a couple of papers I'll show you that are hot off the presses. Uh, this is uh, data from Paris that was uh, published last year. This is uh, from Mathieu Schmidt and Alain Combe. This is the Paris Sorbonne University Hospital Network, five ICUs, 83 patients uh, with 60-day follow-up. And they were able to uh, show, this is called a stacked bar plot, uh, where you have those uh, alive and out of the ICU in the blue at the top, those who had died uh, accumulating uh, in the uh, uh, salmon color at the bottom. Uh, here you can see the very few patients who are still on ECMO, and these are the ones who are off ECMO, but in the ICU at 60 days. And so there's a, a 31% um, probability of mortality at day 60 and 36% at day 90. Really quite good outcomes that are comparable to what we saw in Eolia. This is during the first wave. Um, this is literally hot off the presses out this week online, uh, a follow-up paper in Lancet Respiratory Medicine from the folks in Paris. This is now a much larger cohort uh, put together by uh, Guillaume Le Breton and Pascal Le Prince and, and others, uh, 17 ICUs in what they call the greater Paris uh, area where they, they created an ECMO network organization where they were uh, really uh, cohorting resources between the different ICUs uh, and uh, having uh, centralized regulation of, of indications. Um, of the six mobile ECMO teams that uh, were being reported here, only one previously existed, the other five were created during COVID. So a massive, a very impressive effort. And again, this is through the, the first wave, uh, March through June. Uh, 302 ECMO patients, median age of 52. As we see in almost all of these studies, 78% men. Uh, 55 of them are actually transferred by, by mobile ECMO. And in the end, the 90-day mortality actually 54.3%. And I think important to look at the factors that were associated with mortality. Uh, in the uh, top left, you can see uh, this is if your center had done fewer than 30 cases in the red or greater than or equal to 30 cases and survival was much better in experienced centers. Uh, and that's why this data uh, differs a bit from uh, some of the data uh, presented in the first paper because overall uh, there were uh, more uh, less experienced centers. Um, here you can see that age, and this has been a strong risk factor as I'll show you again, uh, age less than 48, uh, 49 to 56, and then greater than 57 with worsening survival with increasing age. And then uh, they did show that there was a difference about how long you had been intubated in terms of uh, survival prior to going on ECMO. And this, uh, the blue line uh, with the best survival is less than three days. Uh, so less than three days actually did show an advantage. Um, also out very recently, just a, a week ago uh, online is the Chilean experience. This is Rodrigo Diaz and colleagues being published uh, in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Um, and they also reported this time on an, an entire nationwide Chilean cohort. So this is all uh, ECMO for COVID-19 uh, from March through August, again, sort of their first wave. 
uh, from a link national uh, uh, data from uh, national agencies, 94 patients in total, and they were able to go back and fully analyze 85 of those patients. And ultimately their 90 day mortality, even under extreme stress was also 38.8%, very much comparable to what we would see in Eolia. Uh, what about in the US? This is one of the experiences published on behalf of the Stop COVID investigators, where they looked at 190 uh, COVID-19 patients who received ECMO across 35 hospitals. And what they did is what's called an emulated target trial, essentially taking observational data and uh, with very fancy statistical techniques, uh, making it as though it were a randomized controlled trial. And they chose uh, to use criteria of ECMO uh, that was initiated within seven days with a PDEF ratio that's generous in terms of normal criteria, PDEF ratio less than 100. Uh, what's important is that the mortality with ECMO in that cohort was 34.6% and without ECMO 47.4%. Uh, and here you can see the unadjusted survival curves clearly favoring ECMO. Uh, what about the international experience? Uh, this is uh, our paper from uh, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization. I want to point out my colleagues, Ryan Barbro, Graham McLaren, and Phil Boonstra, who really did a tremendous job leading this effort. Uh, this is uh, from a COVID-19 addendum that was created specifically for the registry, 1,035 COVID-19 ECMO patients, so still by far the largest uh, cohort reported. And this is from 213 centers across 36 countries. And the outcomes um, here, the estimated cumulative incidence of in-hospital mortality 90 days after initiating ECMO was 37.4%, again, very, uh, consistent data. And this is, again, from 36 different countries. Uh, here's another stacked bar plot. You can see uh, those who were discharged home or rehab at the top, those who died at the bottom. And I would point out that there are more patients here uh, where we don't really know what happened to them, uh, discharged uh, to an LTAC or another hospital, for instance. Um, so uh, these are estimated uh, probabilities of 90-day uh, mortality. What factors were associated with, uh, with uh, mortality? Again, here, age, by decade of life, 40s, 50s, 60s, and greater than 70. You can see strongly associated uh, with uh, increasing mortality. Immunocompromised status, chronic respiratory disease. If you had a cardiac arrest prior to ECMO, that was uh, clearly associated with uh, worse outcomes. And the initial mode being either venoarterial or venovenous arterial as opposed to uh, venovenous. Uh, extending the ELSO data, this is from the Euro ELSO, the European branch of ELSO. Uh, this is uh, a, a survey done in Europe involving both uh, ELSO and non-ELSO centers uh, led by Roberto LaRusso and Jan Belolovic. Uh, and this is March through September, uh, and they had 1,531 patients. So less granular data, but the largest uh, cohort of all uh, from 177 centers in Europe. And this was published uh, in intensive care medicine. And overall, their mortality was a similar 45%. Um, there is one other uh, study that I just wanted to show you because I think it's important, uh, especially for this community to know about if you haven't already seen it. Um, Asif Mustafa and colleagues from Rush University and Advocate Christ in Chicago published this. It's a letter in JAMA surgery, and it's only 40 COVID-19 patients, um, but I do think it's, it should have some influence on us in the way we think about how to approach these patients. Um, they used the OLEA criteria, and they used uh, a, uh, a package of interventions that they developed very early on in the pandemic. And there's a lot of focus on the fact that they use the Protec Duo, a dual lumen cannula that uh, uh, you'll likely hear about again from Dr. Haft later, uh, which functions both as ECMO and as an RVET. Uh, but they did several other things and it's hard to interpret which of these, if not all of them combined, may have made the difference because they reported very good outcomes. And that included direct thrombin inhibitors, high dose glucocorticoids before the recovery trial came out, and at even higher doses, uh, inhaled nitric oxide and a goal to extubate the patients and try to do physical therapy with them. Um, here you can see uh, the patients uh, who were put on ECMO, here extubated, decannulated, discharged from the ICU and discharged from hospital. At the time of reporting, they reported a 15% mortality, but 11 patients were still in the hospital. Very reassuring is their follow-up letter to JAMA, JAMA surgery in which uh, all patients reporting with a still only a 17.5% mortality. Now they like uh, others are having uh, not the same uh, outcomes uh, in the later wave, as I'll show you. There's still a lot of upcoming data. This is, again, what we reported uh, in the Lancet, the 37.4%. But I would draw your attention, this is a recent screenshot from the ELSO uh, website, where we have a live update now at uh, over 6,000 cases, but the mortality is 50%. And that 50% includes this uh, first thousand patients. So uh, since the reporting, the uh, mortality is over 50%, it's actually around 54%. And we'll have that data out uh, hopefully relatively soon. But it's a warning that across the world, the outcomes have not been the same as we saw during the first wave. And our uh, approach to patients should vary depending on our ability to have success with that approach. 
So ECMO for COVID-19 related ARDS, first of all, follow the ARDS algorithm as you would previously. And second, evidence is accumulating, but we have a lot left to learn. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Brody, for that uh, kind of overview of um, where we're at currently with the data. Um, you know, the first poll that we put up before you started your talk clearly indicates that this is becoming a widespread practice with a full, um, uh, over half of the, the respondents to the poll saying that they had done more than 10 ECMOs at their institution. Um, so um, clearly this is a is something that's hot on everybody's mind and wanting to know, you know what other places are doing. Um, the first question that pops up to me is, um, as we've kind of gone through this at your institution and what you're seeing in the data, what really should be uh, you know, some absolute red flags that correlate to um, decreased survival, higher mortalities in these, in these ECMO patients? Well, uh, as the data accumulates, I think there are a few things that we know, and, I, and I, this is why I included that, the slide from uh, the Lancet data. Uh, we do know that increasing age, and this is true across COVID-19, but it's certainly true uh, in the COVID-19 ECMO population specifically, that increasing age is really associated very strongly with increased mortality. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't put on patients of advanced age, uh, but it does mean that we have to consider that uh, and that it's not necessarily ages to do so. It really does impact the ability to uh, successfully perform ECMO. And then it's all of those other factors that uh, I named both from the Lancet study and more recently from the French data. Um, you know, it, it, in the end, it's a gestalt. Uh, you know, do they have chronic respiratory disease? Are they immunocompromised? How long have they been on the ventilator? There are a few things that I, that I think we need to uh, take into account now as compared with earlier. Um, the, in the first wave, we had a lot of patients who weren't receiving corticosteroids. In fact, the majority before the recovery trial came out had not been. And so now, by the time you reach the point where we might consider ECMO, you're almost invariably steroid refractory, and that's a different population. Um, the same thing may be true, and this is, these are just hypotheses, we can't prove them at this stage, um, that we're putting patients on non-invasive forms of ventilation for longer periods of time prior to even intubating. So we often talk about how long are they intubated before we put them on ECMO. And you know, seven days has been one of the, uh, one of the things that we've um, uh, you know, uh, held as, uh, as a standard you know, across uh, ECMO for many years, but we know it's not absolute. Um, and I showed you the data from France suggesting that you know, there, there is a difference with how long they're on ECMO, but there may also be a big difference with how long they're on these forms of uh, you know, high flow nasal cannula or, or a non-invasive ventilation mask uh, prior to going on. The reason is many of them have worse work to breathe uh, you know, or higher work of breathing than we um, excuse me, might, uh, might suggest by just looking at them. And in doing so, they might create lung injury, what's called patient self-inflicted lung injury. And so by the time they get intubated, they're already stiffer, they're already farther advanced in their ARDS. And so that clock may actually be starting earlier. Again, it's a hypothesis. And we don't have an exact number of days that you know, we can take into account. But nowadays, when we know somebody's been on ECMO for three weeks, or excuse me, on uh, high flow for three weeks prior to being intubated, we do tend to take that into account uh, because we have seen worse outcomes with those patients. Um, you know, and uh, yes, I and, and I think we're we're as the second wave kind of evolves, we're seeing the data uh, changing, and we'll have more on that uh, kind of at the end. And I would also like to remind the audience to use your Q and A feature, um, and and we will ask the the panelists questions as we move along. Um, you know, to piggyback on the question of optimization prior to intubation. Um, you know, there seems to be a disparity in standard practice in the use of inhaled vasodilators. Um, the Chicago group use them exclusively, as you pointed out in one of your slides. Um, do you have any insight on what the role of, um, you know, inhaled vasodilators should be in the optimization uh, of these patients? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And it's a question for that direct initiation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think the, the data has not changed from what we knew before COVID. There have been a couple of small studies uh, that don't suggest specific benefit in the setting of COVID, although there was some, uh, at least uh, hypothesis that was very reasonable that maybe vasodilation, uh, you know, particularly in such a, a, a vascular disease, um, could make a difference, but we haven't seen that. And so I think the role should be just as it always has been, it's a rescue, right? So it improves oxygenation uh, by redistributing uh, the uh, blood flow to where there is uh, gas exchange or where it's optimized. And so you'll improve VQ matching. Uh, but as we know, the improvement of oxygenation does not correlate with uh, survival in patients with ARDS. So 
Um, we saw that in the ARDSNET ARMA trial where, uh, you know, a couple of days in, having a higher oxygenation was associated with worsened mortality uh, because it was associated with being on the higher tidal volume group. Same thing in the oscillate trial higher oxygenation was associated with worsened mortality. So it's not a good surrogate outcome. Uh, it is true that if the patient has a PDF ratio of 20, you might wanna to try to rescue them with inhaled vasodilators. And I think that's, everybody would consider that reasonable. But using them routinely, especially, and this is the question I get asked most often, should we use inhaled vasodilators to make the PDF look better so they don't have to go on ECMO? And in my opinion, no. In my opinion, if a ECMO, again, you know, as the data evolves in, uh, COVID specifically, I think we have to take everything with a grain of salt. If you're talking about non-COVID data, absolutely not. You would want to use, uh, because we have the data from Eolia uh, and the CSER trial, you would want to use it because it, it, it has an ostensible mortality benefit, whereas the inhaled vasodilators don't. Uh, in the setting of COVID, because the mortality is uh, rising, again, some of that may even be because of variants or other factors that we don't yet know how to uh, isolate, you might be a, a little bit more prone to trying to put off uh, ECMO, but I, I wouldn't use it in lieu of that. I would really use it as a rescue therapy. And uh, before we move on to Dr. Paquetta, uh, Dr. CJ, did you have any uh, poll questions, I mean, any audience questions that have been submitted you would like to ask Dr. Brody? I think Dr. Brody just answered one of those most common questions. Uh, one of the uh, attendees just asked about inhaled vasodilators. I think uh, he directly addressed them. Another question that we have uh, is, uh, is there, if the resources are constrained, should we limit the ECMO to age less than four, 50 on event less than four days? Or is there <laughs> stricter restrictions on putting these patients on ECMO when the resources are uh, constrained is the question that we're yeah. being asked. Yeah, and, and you know, I think too, um, Dr. Brody, if you'd care, we can discuss this at the end and this is directly, I think we're gonna hear about more on that from Dr. Paquetta in just a minute. Um, yeah. He specifically kind of addresses that and some risk scoring um, strategies. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to open up the second poll um, for our audience. Um, and we'll give everybody about 40, 45 seconds or so to respond. Um, this is... Um, I think directly pertaining to some of those stack bar plots uh, that we looked at in Dr. Brody's um, slides a moment ago. Um, the, the curve tends to level out and these patients can stay on uh, ECMO um, for um, quite a considerable period of time. We are seeing a couple more questions coming by. I think most of the questions will be addressed by our couple of other next panelists. So I'm just gonna wait on that, um, the Q&A sessions. I'm just telling the attendees uh, their questions will be answered shortly. Yes, and the audience will also save some of these for the end where we can get some good audience, some good panelist discussion um, amongst each other um, and, and get some different perspectives. So um, that's a full minute, we'll end the poll there. And I'll share the results so everybody can see. So, you know, um, kind of reflecting what we're seeing in the data of these um, kind of um, long run ECMO patients, uh, full 45, 44% uh, say the longest run of their um, ECMO at their institutions is greater than 60 days. Um, so clearly a huge commitment in resources for um, for our ECMO patients uh, at, at our different hospitals. Um, with that, uh, we'll move on to Dr. Baquetta, um, who will be discussing exactly what we just alluded to. Who um, put on when to say no and talking about some transplant considerations. Dr. Baquetta, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, to the societies for, for letting me uh, uh, participate in this. Um, this is a very uh, long title and it encompasses quite a bit. We're going to try and cover this quickly. Um, uh, Dr. Brody provided excellent uh, background and data to sort of uh, really lead into this discussion. You know, who to put on, when to say no. Um, I think that was an excellent review of, of the data for us at our institution and, and a lot of the institutions that I speak to. There's a real stress 
on the importance of the process of making this decision. Uh, it's not quite as bad as it was during the peak for us because there were a lot more resource constraints and we had to uh, factor that in. But um, all of the ECMO COVID patients, we make as a team uh, that decision on whether or not to put somebody on. And there are a lot of factors to consider. The, the experience of your center, your bed availability, your staff availability, your case mix in your ICUs uh, that really are part of that decision-making process. I think also um, the local and regional factors that have to be considered. Are you sitting in an area where there's multiple institutions that have ECMO capacity? For example, in the, the Paris group, you know, there are several centers there that can provide support. Um, you may uh, be in a situation where you may be the only game in town for you know, a couple hundred miles. And so the way that you think about um, putting people on and, and how to manage uh, may be a little bit different. So we have a fairly um, well, I think, well-described uh, process that we utilize in our institution. I think a lot of institutions uh, go through a very similar approach. So the decision-making process for us, we look at patient information because of course the, the devil is in the details and I think Dan's uh, presentation certainly uh, bears that out. You know, knowing not just the age of the patient, but you know, when were they diagnosed? How long were they on non-invasive ventilation before they got intubated? How many days have they been on? Have they received what we would consider standard of care? Are they getting neuromuscular blockade? Are they being prone and so forth? Um, all of these are critical factors in making a decision. We run that through our ECMO inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and then we um, have created a, a patient prioritization stratification, which is a modification of what the Minnesota ECMO consortium put, put out. Um, and it really incorporates a lot of the things that, that uh, Dr. Brody's presentation already touched on. Then we take into account our health system information, meaning what are our equipment limitations and what are our personnel limitations. That <clears throat> thankfully is not as critical right now, but during the peak, it was certainly a major concern of, you know, how much equipment do you have and how stressed is your staff? So this is a bit of an eye chart and it's gonna be difficult to read it. I don't want you to have spend too much time on it, but I, I do wanna point out that, you know, the person that takes that consult is gonna have a tremendous amount of details about that patient and all of the things that the factors that we've already discussed. And then we're gonna go through our inclusion criteria. And I will point out that, you know, we want patients to be optimized before we consider putting them on ECMO. And we've looked at, uh, uh, you know, where their airway pressures are, are we prone, have we used the blood, neuromuscular blockades. Um, this does incorporate a little bit of the thinking from Eolia and then we run through our exclusion criteria. And then we color code this as a green, yellow, or red. And if there's no contraindications, then um, uh, we would continue to go through that. Relative contraindications. And you'll see here that we have incorporated uh, factors like age. BMI is in there, but I have to tell you, this is truly a relative uh, contraindication. I will tell you in our institution, um, we've had patients that have BMIs of 60, um, of uh, most of our patients have BMIs that are in the 40s. But number of days intubated is critical, but I think uh, Dr. Brody already pointed out that we have to think about how long have they been on BiPAP, how long have they been OptiFlow, all of the other non-invasive techniques to try and prevent intubation for these patients. And then of course, some absolute contraindications, which again, uh, age is a major factor and the data certainly seems to bore, uh, bear that out. Um, whether or not there's other chronic uh, lung diseases. We also um, then incorporate that into our prioritization uh, scoring. And we look at our equipment limitations. And thankfully, as I said, we're not in that peak that we were before. Um, <clears throat> but this all factors into the way that we think about making a decision. And these are some of the critical ways in, in our thought process for a priority score. Age is critically important. That's what we've seen in our own institution and what the data has suggested, you know, what's, how sick are they? Uh, what are the comorbidities associated with that? So <clears throat> when to stop? I mean, this is a challenging question and it's one that we always face in, in uh, critical care. And it doesn't matter whether it's ECMO 
uh, you know, for COVID patients or other types of uh, advanced uh, uh, patients with advanced physiologic insults. You know, obviously multi-failure or uh, patients that are accumulating organ failure um, with a progression of their organ failure and had came in with primarily a lung problem. Next thing you know, they're on dialysis. They have some liver dysfunction. The heart's not looking so good. You, know, you have to start to ask the question of, of when to stop. And <clears throat> evidence of irreversible lung injury, you know, with extensive fibrosis on cats on CT scan. And I'm sure that virtually everyone in our audience has seen this in their, in their practice. Um, if there's a contraindication to, to lung transplant, then that patient is not someone who's probably going to make it out of the hospital. And um, I think if you're on ECMO and you're, you've got irreversible injury and you're not going to uh, have uh, the offer of a lung transplant, then that's something you would ask you know, when to stop. We have had patients who were awake on ECMO um, that we were thinking about lung transplant and they just did not want to be considered for that. And they elected for withdrawal. And these are, these are very t difficult questions, but I think that <clears throat> you, know, you will um, unfortunately eventually come up against cases like that. And then severe irreversible neurologic injury, and, and fortunately in this disease, um, that seems also, also to have been um, uh, unfortunately a, a common uh, complication. So when do we consider lung transplant in our institution? Well, um, obviously clearance of the COVID infection. Um, we have worked very hard to ensure patient consent. Now there are other programs that have relied on surrogates. In our institution, it's just been our practice to try and have patients awake and able to consent. And we've put a lot of emphasis on mobilization, meaning that we've been able to provide appropriate and adequate physiologic support for these patients. And sometimes that's required us to use uh, more than one ECMO machine to do that, to ensure that they were able to you know, use a bike in bed, we'll bring that in, let them pedal, uh, have them stand up in bed. And some of our patients have been ambulatory and walking around the ICU, but we always try and achieve that for our patients before uh, doing a transplant. Time on ECMO. This is a variable that I think we're all wrestling with. And obviously uh, by the poll, you can see that uh, many people are having patients that are on for you know, more than two months. And the patients that we've transplanted um, have been on generally for more than two months. So the other thing that we consider is course on ECMO. We, we all know if you've worked in the field long enough that <clears throat> patients will have complications on ECMO and how you manage those. Some of them are quite minor. Some of them are quite, uh, you know, uh, can be real showstoppers because, you know, it's not uncommon for these patients to develop pneumothoraces. They can develop a hemothorax. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of different types of complications that are, can occur, but they need to be manageable complications. And obviously, we want evidence of irreversible uh, lung damage and fibrosis. And, uh, and the patients, obviously, that we've transplanted, we've seen that. And I think the other centers that have reported um, transplanting patients have, have certainly um, clarified and, and ensured that, that there was irreversible damage. We, um, I would strongly advocate for single organ failure. Now that said, we have done a heart lung transplant for a patient that had COVID. Um, it was a relatively young patient uh, in his 40s and um, uh, you know, thankfully everything worked out fine. Uh, we did have him on a little bit of a device to support him. Um, whether or not we would consider combined lung kidney is I think something that all centers are gonna face because many of these patients have developed renal failure. Uh, thankfully, most of them recover, but it's not uncommon for these patients to require some renal replacement therapy. So <clears throat> a major problem is we simply don't know what the natural history is yet. You know, for survivors with persistent symptoms. And so, you know, are, are we transplanting prematurely, which we definitely do not want to do, <clears throat> or, or should we be starting the workup on these patients sooner rather than later? And I think it's, it's going to be a long time before we truly understand the natural history of this disease. And where I don't think we're going to have the answer anytime in the near future. I think it's going to take us a couple years to have greater clarity on this. So, for long-term impact, you know, which is obviously critical in making a decision about transplant, you know, sorting through the long haulers is going to be 
is going to be critically important. The NIH is obviously uh, sponsoring a lot of research in this area. Um, <clears throat> you know, patients that um, are leaving the ICUs and the hospitals with chronic respiratory symptoms, we're still trying to figure out what pathway are they going to follow? They're going home with maybe a couple liters of nasal cannula. Do they improve? Are they stable? Is there a progression of disease? And obviously we want to intervene in a timely fashion um, when, when doing our lung transplant evaluations. We also have to consider what's the impact on patients with mild chronic lung disease that you know, they already have a little bit of lung disease and they get COVID. And um, are those patients that we would consider transplanting sooner rather than later because of the greater impact? And we've had patients that <clears throat> who have chronic lung disease and got COVID and we ultimately uh, did transplants on those patients. So in summary, the decision-making for using ECMO for COVID-19 patients really, I think, needs to be a thoughtful team-based decision-making process. It's a multi-factorial decision. I think the, the data that uh, Dr. Brody presented, obviously, in, would encourage that type of process. Um, the decision to stop ECMO, I think, is just consistent with you know, our usual ethical medical guidance regarding any withdrawal of care. Um, I'm not sure that it is unique to COVID. Um, you know, progression of organ disease, irreversible lung injury without transplant option. And when it comes to uh, transplanting for patients that have COVID-19 um, and whether or not they're on ECMO or not, I think you have to have obviously confirmation of irreversible lung injury, which I think we're still sorting through. I don't think we have definitive answers on. It's obvious in some patients, the fibrosis is so clear cut but I think there's gonna be a, a large intermediate crowd that we don't know the answer to yet. Patient mobilization and awareness is something that has been a priority in our own program. And we really want to have consent with clarity. We really um, do everything we can to support that patient physiologically on ECMO so that they can participate in this decision-making process. Thank you. Great, Dr. Paquetta, I really appreciate uh, the wonderful presentation on helping us kind of decide um, which patients uh, to uh, place on ECMO and then what their ultimate bridges are following that. You know, one of the challenges we face here um, really are these so-called gray area patients uh, that you alluded to in, um, in your algorithm for decision-making early on in your slides of, you know, the patient with the BMI between 45 and 55. Um, the patient who is um, not uh, maybe uh, meets absolute contraindications for age criteria, but is slightly younger than that, but is not a young patient. Um, uh, and, and also we, you know, I'm interested in, to, in hearing your practice on how you kind of help delineate these patients, how you factor in the role of super infections. A lot of these patients come in with uh, pneumonias and have had less than optimal care at outlying centers. So um, I would be interested to hear your take on that. Well, <clears throat> the, the gray zone remains gray. Um, you know, there's just so much that we don't know yet. Um, I, I would love to provide clear cut answers on this, but we are still wrestling with the natural history of this disease. Um, that part of it is still novel to us. As far as, you know, sort of very specific aspects of the role of BMI, uh, you know, we've, we've put people on that had BMIs of 60 and they've done fine. Um, it is a relative contraindication. I think what is critically important is understanding it's not just BMI, it's what is the mass of the patient? How heavy are they and how much physiologic support are they going to need? Because that sort of pushes the limits of what your equipment will provide. And we have had to use, you know, two ECMO devices to support some of our larger patients. Um, because, you know, you can, you know, we do this, we think, okay, well, the, the calculated cardiac output is whatever, make up a number, five liters. These patients are critically ill. Their demand is much greater than that. It's eight liters, it's nine liters. And the younger patients, it could easily double. And so then you're stuck in a situation where you're tr supporting them on ECMO, but they're actually not supported um, adequately. And so you're pushing the vent. And when you start to think about what's the impact on outcome um, with having a patient that's inadequately supported, what can you do to correct that? In our case, 
um, we've just gone ahead and, and put some of the larger patients that have greater de uh, demand on two uh, units. And uh, that's actually, you know, we've had to do that for patients that we've transplanted as well. So <clears throat> the gray remains gray. Um, we're still wrestling with that. I think that as far as the age criteria, there's a lot of data to suggest that older patients just don't do as well. Uh, we always have this argument that yes, that guy's 60, but you know, he was jogging every day and he's, you know, physiologically, he's actually 40. Um, <clears throat> but I'll tell you, it's still, we've, at least in our, in our institution, age has been a major factor and data certainly seems to suggest that. So um, we're working through that. <laughs> Okay. Your age, like a good ECMO run, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, let me ask uh, Dr. CJ, uh, while we uh, are in this interim, if there's any audience questions, I think we've had one or two uh, participants that uh, have a question for you, Dr. Paquetta. Sure. It's just most of the questions was like, uh, what, at what point of time are you guys deciding to extubate the patient? I mean, obviously, or... Uh, to go for a tracheostomy on those patients? Is there a specific number of days you would put them on ventilator? And what is the ventilator strategy for uh, these patients or sedation strategy for these patients if the plan is for a bridge to lung transplant? Well, um, most of these patients end up having tracheostomies. And I think there's, you can actually ask the question about when you should be doing the tracheostomy earlier or later. I think we've tended now to uh, uh, make that decision to treat patients earlier in their course. Um, I don't think that's a loss. It doesn't keep people from participating in decision-making. Um, extubation is, uh, I think um, it's nice if you can do it, but I don't consider it a, a great strategy um, because these patients have variable courses. They can look good one day. They don't look good the next day. Uh, I think they're at risk for aspiration, which is, not, you know, aspiration pneumonitis on top of COVID is not going to go well. Um, and so having some control of that airway, I think, is, is important. That said, we've had patients that were extubated, uh, walking around, and then uh, got transplanted. I think you, it's just such individual decision-making for, for that patient. How can you support the patient to be as active and, part and uh, participatory in their care as possible? And that's what you do to achieve it. And if it means that you have to treat the patient and you leave them on some type of intermittent ventilatory support, or you can extubate them, it's whatever, whatever allows you to achieve that uh, goal for the patient. Thank you, Dr. Pekeda. I think uh, the, some of the other questions are going to be answered by Dr. Half shortly in the next talk. So I think we should uh, go for him. Great. Okay, thank you, Dr. Paquetta. I'm sure we'll have more at the end during our uh, question and answer session with all the panelists. Okay, with that, I'll, um, I'm gonna open up our uh, poll before Dr. Haft's uh, talk, who is gonna talk to us about some cannulation strategies, different techniques and thoughts on the topic. Um, let's see. Okay, we'll give everybody a couple seconds to respond to this. Um, initial VV ECMO cannulation strategy at your institution. Another common question for Dr. Vaketa uh, from the audience is, uh, when you say two ECMO circuits, how are you connecting their circuits? I think that's something that we can discuss at the end or if you have time, while the poll is going on, we can do it. Uh, it sounds like we probably should move on, but I'm happy to answer that question. Great. And this obviously is, a, is an evolving topic as different groups report on different uh, device strategies, obviously the Chicago paper with the ProTech Duo, et cetera. So this is something that I know is hot on a lot of people's minds. Okay, that's about a minute. I'm gonna close the poll there. Okay. Looks like um, most, a full 52% are using an IJ uh, femoral cannulation strategy. Um, uh, and uh, 
the next in line is pretty evenly split between uh, double lumen cannula like the Avalon and a FemFem approach. So um, I'm sure Dr. Haft will have some thoughts on that. Um, Dr. Haft, if you want to share your screen now and we can um, get going on your talk. Hey. Adam, are you able to see my screen? I am, uh, and just, I would, yep, there you go, perfect. Miracle. Okay, great, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to this, uh, this group, truly an honor uh, to be uh, considered to uh, be part of this panel here. Um, so uh, I was asked to talk about technical factors and, and I interpreted that as, as issues related to the circuit. So uh, I wanna to talk to you about the ECMO circuit, what we're currently using. A lot of what we know is, is from the ELSA registry where this data is collected. Uh, but but this this uh, this webinar is sponsored by ASIO, uh, which is an organization that is really devoted to innovation. So I also want to touch a little bit upon uh, what I feel are some opportunities. So uh, an ECMO circuit is a, a very very simplified cardiopulmonary bypass circuit that just consists of a a blood pump and a gas exchange device. So let's dive into each of those two elements. So in terms of the blood pump, if you look at the ELSA registry for the adult population well over 95% of centers are now using centrifugal design pumps. And the reason we use centrifugal design pumps, is a couple of reasons, one is, is because of its small size, that small footprint makes it very conducive for the ICU. Uh, but the other reason is because of inherent features about centrifugal pumps that make them safer. You can only produce so much negative pressure and so much positive pressure on the inlet and the outlet that again, it makes them inherently safer. And, and in many cases, you don't require you know, specifically trained personnel like perfusionists at the bedside, uh, preventing catastrophic complications with these pump designs. Now, there's a whole bunch of different pumps that are on the market that can be used uh, for ECMO, and I'll present some of them uh, based upon the, the frequency uh, of use in the ELSA registry. Uh, this is the Rotaflow from uh, McKay. This is the Centromag uh, uh, distributed by Abbott. This is the Revolution sold by uh, Soren and Levanova. Uh, here you see the Affinity Pump by Medtronic. Uh, and lastly is the uh, LifeSpark pump recently introduced by uh, uh, Levanova and the Tandem Life Group. Um, so there's no question there has been a lot of innovation in pump design. These pumps are way better uh, than the pumps we were using decades ago for, for ECMO. However, there continue to be limitations. You know, these pumps create a tremendous amount of shear from their rotational speed. And we know that shear can cause damage to lots of things, including von Willebrand factor. And published in the ASAIO journal uh, was the experience of uh, ECMO and its association, clear association, with destruction of large multimers of von Willebrand factor. And our group uh, also published in a SIO journal uh, that clearly there was a change in what we saw as the bleeding complications when we switched from roller pumps to centrifugal, uh, centrifugal pumps, seeing more of these non-surgical bleeding events like nasopharyngeal and gastrointestinal bleeding. So, so the point is here is that there are opportunities, even though pumps are better today than they used to be, we really do need to, to address these unmet needs of finding pumps that have gentler uh, blood handling characteristics. Now switching over to the gas exchange devices, the oxygenators, so we should certainly celebrate uh, the contributions of uh, Ted Colbo, this lovely picture of him in his kitchen holding the uh, uh, silicone spiral wound lung uh, that was used in tens of thousands of patients that required ECMO, uh, most of whom owe their lives to him. Uh, we certainly uh, owe a lot of thanks to him because I think he really made ECMO possible. Uh, now we have moved beyond the silicone uh, spiral wound lung and are now using a polymethyl pentene based hollow fiber uh, so the way these devices work is that oxygen flows on the inside of the fiber. Uh, you can see here and blood percolates on the outside of the fiber. And the fiber itself is made out of this plastic polymethyl pentene, which is gas permeable and very durable. These oxygenators can work for, for days, weeks, and sometimes even uh, months. Um, first published in a SIO journal, the clinical use of a polymethyl pentene based oxygenator uh, in the European experience by uh, Giles Peak. Now in the US market, there's not nearly as many oxygenators uh, as there are pumps. This is the uh, McKay Quadrox, uh, clearly does the heavy lifting uh, in the US by far, uh, the, 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 the most frequently utilized. Uh, this is the Eurosets, which is now sold by Abbott uh, in the US. Uh, recently introduced is the Nautilus uh, by Medtronic, has some nice uh, features that, uh, that, that may uh, uh, increase its penetrance in the US market. And then lastly is the Tandem Lung, again, part of that Tandem Life package uh, by Levanova. The Tandem Lung is the only oxygenator that does not have uh, an integral heat exchanger. So this device is, is designed really to be worn by the patient to minimize uh, the circuit transit time and the uh, conductive heat loss. 
So again, oxygenators, the, you know, the, the, the polymethyl pentene was transformative uh, in terms of uh, uh, how oxygenators were utilized, but there continued to be uh, opportunities. So <clears throat> number one is polymethyl pentene. There's only one company in the world that makes polymethyl pentene fibers. All the companies rely on this one industry. Uh, and that can be problematic when you have a sudden you know, uh, influx in use of ECMO, like in a pandemic, there may be issues with, with manufacturing and distribution. But even beyond that, all of these oxygenators, the flow through them is non-physiologic. And the non-physiologic flow uh, requires recirculation to increase residence time. All of that creates shear. We know that shear can be harmful for, for cellular blood elements, uh, but it also creates inefficiency in gas transfer. And that's why these oxygenators need to have huge surface areas and you need to use oxygen for sweep, not just uh, room air. And so, so there are opportunities. And so why don't we make artificial devices that have more physiologic flow as was published in a SIO journal using microfluidic flow channels. And this is something that our lab has been working on innovation uh, to create artificial lungs using this microfluidic channels uh, for, for a variety of reasons, reduction of shear, improved biocompatibility and uh, efficiency. Now I've described to you pumps and oxygenators as two separate things. Uh, but you can actually uh, acquire them as an integrated system where the pump oxygenator console tubing, everything comes together. There could be inline sensors for monitoring of saturation, uh, pressure and, and other factors. Uh, there's a lot of safety measures which can be very, very useful like bubble detection and retrograde flow. Um, there's uh, uh, several of these integrated systems that are now available in the US market. <clears throat> Again, McKay leads the way with the uh, cardio help system, uh, clearly the highest penetrance. Uh, recently introduced in the U.S. market is the Fresenius Nova Lung system, which uses uh, a, a novel diagonal design centrifugal pump, which, which further reduces its uh, footprint. Uh, and then lastly is the Abiumed Breathe device, which is only slowly getting released uh, in the U.S., but has some novel features, including extremely small footprints in size. So in, in my personal opinion, I, I do believe integrated systems are the future for ECMO. I think the, 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 the future of buying a separate pump and oxygenator uh, is probably on the downswing and we're gonna see all the major industries uh, creating these uh, integrated systems. Now switching to cannulation. Uh, so traditional cannulation for VV ECMO as Adam pointed out uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the poll uh, is venovenous cannulation using two cannulas, typically a drainage cannula in the femoral vein and a reinfusion cannula uh, in the jugular vein. And, and the cannulas that we actually use uh, are for the most part cannulas that are designed and marketed for uh, the minimally invasive cardiac surgery market. Uh, and, and there's a variety of companies in the space, Medtronic, McKay, and Edwards, uh, that all produce cannulas that, that are very effective uh, at, at producing VV ECMO using this approach. The limitation, of course, is recirculation, the idea that you're going to be sucking blood from your drainage cannula that has already been processed by the ECMO circuit uh, reducing its, its efficiency. So the solution for that is a double lumen cannula, the VB uh, double lumen or VBDL as it's referred to in the ELSO registry. And uh, this was first introduced to the world in ASAO journal, the Wang Zwish uh, cannula, which eventually led to the commercialization of the Avalon Elite. Uh, this is a, a dual lumen cannula like a dialysis catheter. Uh, and, and this is obviously large in size to produce near uh, physiologic blood flow. Uh, it's bi cable so the tip of it sits down within the IVC, and the uh, drainage ports are separated from the infusion port by distance uh, to minimize recirculation. In a well-placed VV double lumen cannula, you essentially have no uh, recirculation. Uh, there is a competitor in the market now, the uh, MC3 Crescent, which is sold by uh, Medtronic. Uh, this cannula has some, some features that can be advantageous. Uh, number one is the tip of it sits further down uh, the IVC to uh, promote stability. Uh, and these cannulas come in slightly larger sizes, which may be useful uh, in, the, um, uh, in the COVID obese population that require higher flow. Uh, and lastly is the Protec Duo cannula. This is an interesting cannula that was mentioned in, by the previous speakers. Um, it's a dual lumen cannula. However, the tip sits within the pulmonary artery and the drainage port is in the right atrium. So you're separating the inflow and the outflow, not just by distance, but also by two cardiac valves. So you, you will get zero recirculation with this device. But in addition, you get RV support uh, because you're bypassing the, the right ventricle. And this is now called VPA mode of cannulation in the ELSO uh, registry. So the last thing I want to talk about uh, in the last couple of minutes here is surface coating. So the idea that you're going to take an artificial extracorporeal circuit and make it somewhat more biocompatible. And this has been around for a long time. Carmita coating, which was sold uh, by Medtronic uh, was very effective using covalently bonded heparin first published in 
the Sire Journal in the 1990s. Uh, now, if you don't want to use heparin, there's a variety of other surface coatings that can be used that uh, are, are hydrophilic in nature, again, to reduce uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, thrombogenic deposits on the circuit. Uh, Medtronic has two different products, Trillium and Balance. Guess what? Published in a Sio journal. Uh, the, uh, um, McKay has a variety of different products. The Safe Line, which is albumin designed to reduce uh, a proteinaceous deposition like fibrinogen on circuits, uh, and the BioLine circuit, uh, which is covalently bonded uh, heparin. Uh, and then Eurosets uh, from Abbott uh, uses a different type of hydrophilic coating, phosphorocholine. So all of these surface coatings are uh, helpful. Um, however, there are, there are more opportunities. So all of the, the investigations about these surface coating is really based on short-term impact, really designed for cardiopulmonary bypass, not designed for weeks of support on ECMO. Um, all of them still require systemic anticoagulation. And obviously many of them uh, require, you know, covalently bonded heparin. And for our patients that have heparin sensitivity, that can be a, a potential problem. So, so there are opportunities. And one thing that our lab is working on uh, is a surface coating with a direct thrombin inhibitor, uh, as well as a nitric oxide releaser for local uh, platelet inhibition, uh, as you can see, published in a SIR journal. Um, so in, in summary, um, ECMO requires this, this ever-changing technology. Now, ECMO used to be a cottage industry, uh, but, but now uh, we, we have really large international corporations that are invested in it, which is going to help uh, drive innovation from competition. Um, there certainly are lots of opportunities, as hopefully I've described to you, and, and anybody who's participating in this webinar that has a great idea, I would really encourage you to get involved in a SIO if you're not already are, uh, because it really is the only industry where you sit side by side with clinical leaders, with industry partners, uh, with bioengineers, uh, with members of FDA uh, and members of, uh, uh, of the NIH for sponsorship. So uh, with that, thank you very much for this privilege. Thank you so much. So. I would only uh, say that if you wanna know what's going to be coming in the future, you better be looking at a SIO. <laughs> and thank you. That was a that was a veritable veritable tour of Asayo over the last uh, twenty years in Dr. Hap's uh, presentation, uh, just highlighting some of the things that have been uh, pioneered and, and debuted there. Um, I'm actually going to open up this last poll. Uh, while and now this specifically pertains to your. Uh, uh, the last slide in your talk, uh, Dr. Haft, but I would be interested in opening it up to all the panelists. Um, let me see. Give everybody a minute. Directly pertaining to anticoagulation, uh, uh, we'll give everybody about 30 seconds to answer. I know we're coming up on the hour. We've had some great discussion here. A lot of audience members have asked, uh, too, about anticoagulation strategies. And specifically going back to your talk, uh, Dr. Brody, you know, um, it seems that ECMO in the COVID population seems to have a higher incidence of mechanical and bleeding complications. Um, so some thoughts from the panelists and you, Dr. Haft, uh, in, you know, what you were talking about in your talk of um, your thoughts on why the mechanical complications are higher in the, in the COVID arts population and um, different uh, anticoagulation strategies, be it heparin, direct thrombin inhibitors, and, and really the ideal monitoring, whether it's PTT, 10A, et cetera. I'd be interested to get everybody's thoughts. Well, uh, I don't have a, a great answer for you, but I would propose two things. Number one is that, that we've learned that COVID is a hypercoagulable disease. And so there's probably a greater need for uh, systemic anticoagulation in the COVID patients than, than other people with ARDS. And the second thing is the duration of ECMO support. You're more likely to have complications the longer you are on ECMO. And if you look at the seizure trial, the median duration of ECMO uh, of survivors was nine days. And in our own institution, the median duration of ECMO of our survivors is 21 days for COVID. And so the longer you're on ECMO, the more likely you are to have a complication. So I think those two things are probably factors, but I'm sure uh, Dan or Matt probably have, have uh, good ideas as well. Yeah. And you see from our poll, uh, obviously, most, most centers are using a heparin anticoagulation strategy, which I think is, is what we would expect. I would just add one uh, brief comment, which is uh, I think Jonathan hit it on the head with uh, pointing out the longer ECMO runs. So uh, looking at the ELSO data, again, this is over a thousand patients with uh, COVID-19 who were placed on ECMO. Uh, what you see is that there are more complications that would suggest clotting of the circuit, you know, uh, circuit change and uh, pump clot and so on. 
Um, but if you normalize that for the number of hours on ECMO as compared with pre-COVID times, uh, then you don't see a difference between the populations in terms of the number of complications. Now, that's observational data, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. If everybody around the world is increasing their anticoagulation regimen, well, then that's going to counteract, uh, you know, that would uh, decrease the number of clotting complications. Um, but it, they, we don't have strict data to suggest that uh, there are more complications. I think we all feel like there are, uh, but it does have to balance the, the thrombotic with the bleeding complications. And of course, that's sort of the history of, of ECMO, uh, just a little bit more painful during COVID. Um, you know, and speaking of uh, the evolving data on this, we had alluded uh, when we were talking before about the, how the data is changing with the second wave um, and the increase in some of the mortalities uh, that we're seeing in the more recent data that you highlighted at the end of your talk, uh, Dr. Brody. Um, thoughts on what might be contributing to what we're seeing as kind of a different experience in the second wave as compared with our early ECMO experience? Uh, I mean, I, I would reemphasize sort of the, uh, the uh, we're now selecting for sicker patients, uh, you know, potentially both with steroid refractory, but also with, uh, as we mentioned, the patients who are coming into it with uh, more uh, patient self-inflicted lung injury. Again, those are hypotheses, but, um, you know, maybe contributing. The other thing uh, is uh, viral variants. We just don't know uh, if there are differences between the variants and the way that they uh, affect uh, the lung specifically and, and the degree of ARDS and how that might impact uh, the patients who are receiving uh, ECMO. And then I would just point out, I, I made a point in the stack bar plot from the Lancet study um, to uh, show that there were still a lot of patients for whom we didn't have a final outcome, meaning they were still in a hospital. They might've been transferred from one to another. Well, let's say all those patients died. Actually, we might've underestimated, even though it's an estimated mortality, we might've underestimated it. And so uh, in uh, data that hopefully we'll have coming out in uh, the coming weeks, uh, we should have uh, more final outcomes on patients and be able to give them the right description. And just to piggyback on that, uh, and maybe Dr. Paquetta, you can throw some light on this. How big is this problem, really? Um, what, is, what is your experience at your institution with the number of transplant referrals you're seeing versus how many people actually undergo evaluation versus how many people actually get lungs and how many people survive? Yeah, this is a, a troubling question for us in the transplant community. I can tell you that uh, there's never a week that goes by that we don't get a referral uh, for an evaluation for someone that had COVID uh, for a potential transplant, whether they were on ECMO or not. Um, when I speak to my colleagues around the country, uh, they're they're getting the same thing. I mean, they're you know there are centers that are you know upwards of ten percent of their transplants are patients that had COVID and. That's why I asked the big question and my big concern about the natural history of this disease, because um, we don't have a good sense of that. I can tell you that there is not a week that goes by that we don't get a referral. And I'm, and I'm pretty confident that most large centers are seeing at least that type of, of uh, referral. So I don't have an answer for you because we don't know the answer. I just yeah. tell you that it's a number that's significant. Um, and my concern is that it might be a lot bigger than, than we uh, are prepared for. We appreciate you. Um, Dr. CJ, I would like to give the audience a couple uh, opportunities to participate if you have anything for the panelists. I think most of the questions have been answered by uh, uh, the panelists in their presentations and even after discussions with the questions you asked, Adam. Um, I think for the audience, if they have any more questions like uh, Jasmine predicted, uh, the recorded version of this uh, uh, webinar is going to be available uh, on the TTSNet website. If they have any more questions, they can put in the like, uh, comment sessions. I'm the sure. One, just the one question about the two circuits. Yes, I think I'll if you have time for that, it'll be great. Yeah. So very briefly, uh, I think we, we do not put them in series. Uh, we actually keep them separate. Um, we will cannulate potentially both groins and both IJs basically run like a butterfly type of configuration. And if we feel like we need to have uh, IJ, left IJ access, then we'll act, we put in a very large right IJ uh, return cannula, and then we'll Y those two circuits into that as one return, but two separate drainage uh, sites from the femoral vessels. And we've, we've just sort of nicknamed it the butterfly uh, configuration because I'm not that creative, but uh, that's that's what it can, that's what we settled on. 
but it's actually been very helpful for managing these larger patients that have huge demand um, uh, for support. And it's made, it's really made a difference uh, for those, those patients. So I'm guessing it's all be, because of the flow demand, demand of the flow and the larger BMI. Yeah, yeah, we've we've got some studies going on, you know, where we are actually calculating their their demand, um, and we can see just these enormous uh, uh, spikes in what their demand is uh, that can grow over days, and then uh, the only way to to really address that is to provide just greater uh, support. I have a question: Matt, why, why why do you use two circuits? Why don't you just uh, you know, use one. I mean, the pumps for the most part can can support the demand of even the largest. Yeah, you could you could place in a second oxygenator. Yeah, you could potentially put a single pump, and then we've done that in the past where we put two oxygenators and you run parallel like that. Uh, the problem is you and you mentioned it in your talk is shear. I mean, how high do you want to run your pump flow? I mean, you can turn your whatever pump you're using the flow up substantially. Um, but I think that we've found that it's a little easier hematologically if we have that separate uh, pump that we don't have to run that pump at eight liters per minute. We can run a pump at five liters and another one at four liters or four liters and four liters. And um, you know, we don't have hard data to suggest that that's necessarily better, but I think that if you start thinking about running those pumps at very uh, high flows, um, it, it definitely uh, is, is better from a hematologic standpoint. And we've just, we've done it both ways and we've just been, I think a little happier with, with setting up the uh, two systems. On the uh, same note, what is your anticoagulation strategy for these kind of uh, butterfly circuits? Are you gonna go for the same anticoagulation same thing? Same thing, nothing changes, yeah. And uh, we use heparin, but in patients that we've had issues with, we'll switch to bivalve. Um, and uh, I know we're coming up a little over time here, but Dr. Slaughter, did you have a question? Yeah, one quick question uh, for the panel, Stu. I think a lot of programs, you, you mentioned prone positioning. It is important and shows improvement, but when should it be instituted? Because we frequently get called where a patient has been on the ventilator, and just say four, five, six days, then they prone them, then it's four days later. So yeah. once they're intubated, at what point do you consider prone positioning? Yeah, great, great question. You know, we've wrestled with that as well, and, and it creates a delay in the days of intubation. It obviously, you know, is it has a detrimental effect on, on these patients. So I'll turn it over to the panelists to their thoughts. I mean, I, I would say uh, I would follow the, the current ARDS algorithm, which is if the PDEF ratio is less than 150, then unless they're contraindicated, they should be prone. And it's interesting because the, you know, the number of centers that prone in the United States prior to COVID was minuscule um, and, you know, especially compared with, uh, with Europe and, uh, you know, and, and other parts of the world. And now a lot of centers have started proning. So it's really become part of the, the general algorithm. I agree with not waiting too long if they're failing proning, although failing in this case means meeting EOLIA criteria. So either from P to F or more importantly from very stiff lungs, you know, pH less than 725 or the PCO2 greater than 60. And so uh, greater than or equal to. And so, I, you know, I think that that's, uh, it does have a major role, should be uh, considered standard, should be considered early in that sense, much earlier than you would consider ECMO unless the patient's just incredibly sick uh, up front. Okay. Um... With that, I think we've run out of our time here trying to squeeze an incredibly broad and interesting topic into an hour. Um, I just wanna take the opportunity to thank our panelists again, Dr. Half, Dr. Paquetta, and Dr. Brody for being leaders in the field and sharing their thoughts on obviously a topic that continues to evolve. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to the CTSNet uh, representative Jasmine, who will tell us a little bit more about uh, how this is archived and where to find it and all that good stuff. Thank you to the moderators and panelists for today's discussion. The archived version will be available shortly on the CTSNet website and YouTube channel. Please visit ctsnet.org to explore past recorded live events and learn more about upcoming events on the CTSNet event calendar.